two, one, record. You're on. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is Jen Wetham and Alyssa Sells, and we are so excited for another edition of Kiss Your Spring Quarter 2020. This is part of our lifeboat strategies for faculty who are new to teaching online, and especially in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, obviously, it's different. And our warm up question is not what you're, you're seeing on the slide deck. Um, the warm up question today is uh, What do you most hope to, is it what do you most hope to know today? Is that right? Or maybe just what's a guiding question that, in, that in, in, I don't know, encouraged you or uh, made you decide to come to this session? Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks, Tish. Um, and Alyssa will type that into the chat. And, I, and Tish, I love that notion of a guiding question. That's awesome. Thank you. So today, your facilitator is Tish Lopez. And Tish is English faculty at South Seattle Community College. And Tish, I will give you an opportunity to say a few words about yourself. But first, I would like to brag on you. Um, <laughs> so I have had the distinct pleasure of getting to work with Tish really closely for the last, Tish, I want to say it's the last three years now. I think so. And Tish is one of the senior faculty leaders for our English 101 community of practice. And we decided a couple years ago that it would be great if English faculty could get together to talk about the largest enrolled course in the state, English ampersand 101, and kind of explore like what's what's within that ampersand, <laughs> what ties us all together. And Tish, um, as the group evolved, um, the group decided that they really wanted to focus on on what makes an equitable English 101. And so Tush has been just instrumental in leading that group, uh, both from the both from her expertise as an English faculty member, her expertise in equitable English and equitable strategies for teaching English and, and teaching writing. But also she's just an exceptional facilitator. Um, she's she's just a real delight and she's got a ton of wisdom and I, Tish, it's just a real honor to get to work with you so closely. Um, and thank you for being willing to do this session today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Is there anything you'd like to add about your background? Uh, yes, I'll, sh I'll do a little brief interjection to myself before I jump into the session. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You're like, no, 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 I'm a good teacher. I've just embedded that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tish. Um, and on the chat today, um, I don't, I, I think Joe Monroe um, is, is scheduled to join us. Alyssa Sells, who is um, my, my twin here at the State Board, we're both faculty developers and she specializes in e-learning and I specialize in assessment, teaching, and learning. And we are going to be monitoring the chat. And the purpose of today's session is, and again, for those of you who have been attending regularly, we really wanted to create an interactive online experience that just lets you know you're not alone in this endeavor. There are lots of people who have, um, in fact, Marsha, um, who's on the call right now, uh, and I were just chatting about what graciousness, what generosity um, people are really stepping forward to help each other. And it's, it's really special. Um, it's one of the silver linings of COVID-19. We also want you to walk away with hope that you can do this and that it actually might not be as bad as you thought. And also, um, and I think Tish and Alyssa can both speak to this as well, that after you teach online, your face-to-face -face practice changes, and I would say dramatically improves. Um, it's a very different environment, and it gives you a different skill set that's really transferable to your face-to-face -face class. And then finally, we just want to stress that if there's any guidance we can give you, it's just get your first and second week online up and running, and then you can respond um, after those first couple weeks. So Alyssa and I and Joe will be monitoring the chat. Um, we'll have Tish present. And if, if what she's, um, if your question pertains to what she's discussing in the moment, we'll stop her when it's appropriate and um, ask her to address that question. And if you have a general Canvas question, we are going to post a link into the chat for you. So 
those are kind of our ground rules. Um, also, if you would like the recording emailed to you directly, please just write your email into the chat and I will make sure that you get a link to the recording when it is posted. And Tish, that's all my news that, that's fit to print. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, I will stop sharing <laughs> and mute myself. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me go ahead and share my screen. For some reason, it's not giving me the option. To, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> let me go ahead and close that out. Sorry. Don't worry. No worries. While you're uploading, I'll say one thing that I forgot, which is um, Tisha's session today is really going to focus on student success and improving retention in the COVID-19 situation. Exactly. Uh, so in any case, hi, uh, I'm Tish. I'm an English and Humanities instructor at South Seattle College, and I have, I want to actually say I have over 15 years of online instruction experience, but I can for sure remember 10. Uh, I, and I just want to point out that when I first started teaching online, my student retention rate was 63%, uh, but today it's over 90% most terms, and, and that's through some really simple but effective ways to try to increase student engagement. And so those are some of the things I hope to show you today, but I also hope to build in some time for all of you to ask your questions and for us to troubleshoot and help each other together. Uh, so like I said, my overall goal for today is to share some simple tips that faculty across all disciplines can use to increase student success and retention in your online classes. Um, and I think this is especially important because what you're doing today is very different than online teaching. Uh, you're really doing emergency teaching at a distance. And I think as much as we're being told that they're one and the same, they're really not. Um, one of the ma major differences I see is that both for faculty and students, the entrance into teaching online isn't voluntary. It's, it's mandatory or it's, um, it's something we have to do because of the COVID-19 crisis. And because of that, both students and faculty are working last minute to try to make things work. And uh, that's just very different from teaching a fully online class that's built with a lot of intention and with months of planning. And I just want you to know that I, I recognize that and I think uh, many faculty across our state recognize that as well. Um, but because of that, I think it's more important than ever that we really focus on student success and retention we're going to be working with an extremely high percentage of students who haven't taken any online classes ever. And so we want to think more deliberately about what strategies we can use to engage and support our students. Um, it's worth noting, this is my little brief intro that before we actually get into the nuts and bolts, I just want to share some of the research. Um, in general, even before COVID-19, online learning has uh, experienced a lower student success and retention. So SBCTC data indicates that most colleges in our state have a 10 to 20% lower student completion rate in online versus face-to-face -face courses. And when you look into the reasons why that is, a lot of it comes down to the four, uh, the four bullet points you see on this slide. Uh, <clears throat> the first is isolation. Uh, many students either do not or cannot reach out to their faculty members for assistance which leaves them feeling isolated. Um, oftentimes students report that they feel like they're just being told, for example, to read a chapter and take an exam. And they don't feel like they know who their instructor is or they, really, or they, uh, they never really communicate with their instructor. So they, they feel like they're alone and that causes them to disengage over time. Um, students also often will leave uh, online class because of social difficulties. Uh, oftentimes they don't feel like they're sometimes part of the online community or they have trouble making friends or building relationships with their classmates, which makes them more prone to leave the class. Another big reason students tend to leave online classes is unclear expectations. Um, many students sometimes will believe that, they're, uh, that the academic or uh, the instructor expectations on the students is unclear 
and that often leads those students sometimes to fail to complete assignments or feel despondent or frustrated and then end up leaving. Um, and then finally, the one that most of us recognize is technical difficulties. So if students have te technical difficulties because they have a slow computer or poor internet connection, or um, if there's difficulties because something in Canvas isn't working well, if enough of those challenges build up over time, that can cause a student to disengage. So the five tips I really wanna share with you today are the five tips you see here. So one is, is working on how you can make yourself visible and accessible in your class. Two is develop a strategy to identify and address technical problems early. Three is to mitigate the distance and distance learning by identifying ways to create more faculty to student and peer to peer interaction. Uh, four is to help address unclear expectations by making your courses consistent and easy to navigate. And the last is to be proactive and intervene with struggling students early. Uh, so rather than like take you through a slide or a presentation, I want to make this more interactive. So for each one of these, I'm just going to walk you through one of my old courses and show you some things I do. And what I'd encourage you to do is if at any point you have questions as I'm presenting, ask them. Um, and then we can actually talk about them in real time. Uh, I just think that'll make the session more engaging. So uh, are we ready? Nice. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, so make yourself visible and accessible. So this is a copy of my technical writing course. Uh, I have a front page. Uh, I typically, maybe I should do student view. Well, okay, I'll do student view for now. <clears throat> So there's a front page. I set the settings so they can see my most recent announcements. And then I uh, hid the assignments and the files section that you can usually have visible here because I, one of the things you learn when you teach online classes is students, sometimes if they have multiple ways to get to the information, they think they're seeing different things and they get really confused. So I like to steer them to one place. And so in my class, I steer them to the modules. <clears throat> uh, in my modules, oh, you can't see because this is student. Hold on, let me get out of the student view. Um, so I do have a planning area for myself, which I highly recommend you do if you're new to online learning. Uh, I don't have it visible. I haven't published it for the students. So it's really just for me. So in this section, I have, for me personally, I have notes for myself. So every week as I teach a class, if something doesn't work or I... I have an idea for how to make it better. I have a section where I include notes for myself. Um, I also like to make my feedback easier on me by sometimes creating templates. So if I find myself saying the same thing again and again to students, I will have templates of things I say and I actually store them on Canvas so I don't lose them. Uh, and then in my case, I also have information on just the course outline there. But um, my first, uh, tip was make yourself visible and accessible. So how do I do that in my courses? Uh, the first thing I do is I make sure that I have a, I have a, what's called a getting started on Canvas orientation guide. And I was very intentional about having a welcome message. So I have a welcome message for myself that introduces myself. And I go beyond just a simple paragraph. And I talk about, in my case, I try to, I know that students come into my class with writing anxiety. So I try to help them understand, I that I relate and I understand. Uh, but I also share information about my teaching style, my personal interests. I share information about my dog. Um, but I try to do things that make it personable. Uh, in the past, I've also done video introductions. So this is the text one, but I've also done kind of quick and dirty, like YouTube, like record on my phone introductions as well. So that's one of the first things I do to kind of create a presence for myself. The other thing I do is I, and I highly recommend all of us do this, is create a how to contact your instructor page and include that prominently. Um, I know all of us have our contact info on the syllabus, but in an online class, students often will require just a little bit more detail and instruction on how to contact you. So this is my how to contact your instructor uh, page. I have the best way to contact me, which is through Canvas email. And I actually created a GIF that actually shows them how to do that. Uh, there's a app you can use called, uh, I think it's called Screen to GIF. Um, 
But uh, so I give them the best way to contact me, but I also show them all the alternate ways. And the other thing I give them, which I think is important in an online class, is I share with them the anticipated response time for when I'm going to respond. Hey Tish, this mm -hmm. is all amazing information. And one thing someone is asking, Colleen is asking if, you know how you mentioned that you have templates of uh, things that you've said a lot <laughs> or <laughs> written a lot. Could you show, uh, could you show everyone a template? Uh, yeah, and I'll actually show one related to another thing I'm going to recommend. So uh, as an example, uh, usually Discussion board assignments, when you do them online, can be uh, somewhat challenging because if you don't set them up right, students will typically respond to each other's posts with just simple like, that's great, or I agree, or I disagree, like simple one sentence responses. And so I've been working on how can I engage my students more. Uh, so one of the templates that I have is I have a template, I'll show you actually through one of my slides. Um, this is a template. I use this every single quarter, but it's a response that I, I post on a week one discussion board post. So I want to reinforce what I've talked to my students about, about what is a good discussion board post. And so I've created a template response that I customize slightly for my students. So for the first week, I identify one or two good, strong replies on the discussion board. And then I will paste, I'll, basically I have this language copied on that, um, Canvas page, and then I paste it and I customize it slightly. And so I say here, I say for this first discussion board post, I'm going to point out one to two examples of strong posts to better guide the class. Peter's post is an example of a strong post for the following reasons. And then I give a couple bullets of things he's doing. And I say, all in all, Peter's post is great because by taking the time to share his thinking, perceptions, and personal understanding of technical communication, he helps stimulate thoughts on the topic under discussion. In doing so, he also creates posts that add a teaching presence to the class that has the potential to advance discussion. Uh, and I say, overall, this is a good, strong, uh, you know, a strong initial post. Good job, Peter. I hope this additional feedback is helpful to the class as a whole. I look forward to reading everyone's contribution to this week's discussion. So that's an example. So, but I have them for everything. So if I have <clears throat> uh, in this class, for example, uh, they have a correspondence assignment uh, where they have to uh, respond to some various scenarios and write correspondence um, in response to those scenarios. And so I will often have similar feedback. And so what I've done over time is I've created a feedback that I thought was effective and I've made a, uh, I can do it. In, I've done it in two ways. I've I have like a copy and paste that I include here. Um, and then I also, you can customize your rubrics. I don't know if you want to get that much into the details. Um, I don't know if I should. <laughs> Let's ask. Hey, folks, do you want Tish to get into the details or should she stay high level? What would be useful at this moment? I will show one. Hold on. There's one other useful thing. So lab reports. I think I have it here. <clears throat> so when you create rubrics, you can also uh, when you get rubrics in Canvas, if you want, you can save comments. You want to be careful when you save the comments because they save it for all time. And you, for some reason, Canvas doesn't allow you to delete them. But one thing I will sometimes do is I'll, I will, when I create my rubric, rather than have a rubric where you can click off points for, you know, if it's something is strong, excellent, et cetera, I will actually do the rubric that allows you to do freeform comments. And when you do, you can create a comment. And if you like it, you can click save this comment for reuse. And so what I will often do is if I do the freeform comment one, I will create a couple different templates of a response I'll give for a strong uh, response in a particular category, one for a so-so and a one for a poor, and then I can just slightly tweak it for each student. So the student thinks I've done this really detailed response for them and for them alone, but the, re but the truth is, it's actually a template and I will customize it a little bit based on what I'm seeing, but it is a template that I've created. Tesh, thank you so much. And just so you know, uh, folks wrote high level, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was too low level or weedsy, okay. but I, as a general guidance, I think there's a strong preference for high level.
Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So uh, the other thing I, I highly recommend you do in your classes is your students, if you've, if you've never taught an online class before, your students are going to come to you with lots of questions. And some of them are going to be questions related to technical issues, but other times there are issues that um, you think you set up your assignment correctly and you really didn't. Like you forgot to click something and there's a problem and suddenly you'll just get a flurry of email messages. Um, or the other thing is if you're used to teaching face-to-face, -face, it's easy to just simply explain or give verbal context of the assignment that you've created. But online, you often have to give really explicit directions. And sometimes you don't realize when you're not being explicit until you start getting questions. So in the past, when I used to teach, I used to get just a ton of questions that flooded my email and I would try to answer each one individually. Over time, I realized that wasn't really an effective way of doing it and it was using up a lot of my time. So there's two things I now do that work really well. The first is in my discussions area. I have a, a pinned discussion called I need help. And when you click on it, I just have, have a course related question you need answered, post it here. Either your instructor or one of your fellow students will respond in a timely manner. And then if you're a student, don't be shy. If you know the answer to a question posted, please feel free to answer it yourself. So I actively encourage my students when they have questions to first post it here. And I do actively encourage the classmates, their classmates to respond. So it's not just me. And oftentimes, it usually takes a couple weeks for students to get used to it, but then this section will fill and it'll fill with students' questions. And what's great is if their classmates will often respond for me, um, unless it's something only I can answer. So this is one thing I do. The other thing I've done that's been really effective and I highly recommend it is I've included FAQs on assignments. So, I think I'll show you an example. <clears throat> so in this class, they have, they have case studies they complete. And so I give them a situation and a task, and then they have a submission requirement. If I start getting questions, what I will do is I'll create a frequently asked question and I'll take a question I've been emailed and I'll post it here very generically. And then I'll give an answer. And, uh, and if I, and once I start doing this, students will then feel more comfortable also just to send me their questions, knowing that they're going to be responded to here. Um, obviously, when the student emails me, I let them know that I'm going to respond here and direct them to, to this page. But what's great is now when the next student comes, if they have a similar question, they can see it answered here. Uh, and then for me as an instructor, I can also begin to see where was my instructions not as clear as they could be. So I thought I was really clear when I said revise in this assignment, but I really wasn't because I was getting two or three questions like this. And so that was a clue for me to then go and uh, revise the instructions either immediately in the moment or the next quarter when I teach it. Um, but this practice in general, it's really simple and easy to do, but it's a really great way of um, being able to assist your students as a whole group, because usually if one student's asking a question, you can be guaranteed that there's at least five or six others that have that same question. Um, okay. <clears throat> so let me see. Yeah. Tish, this is great. And I'm just wondering, do folks have comments or questions that they'd like to type into the chat? Even just, this is amazing, keep going. <laughs> but sometimes it's useful to see just what are, what are you thinking? Yeah. Um, so Tish, um, Peter is asking, do you find any particular groups of students have more problems online than others? Um, what are the kind of maybe indicators you look for uh, to know if a student is struggling? Typical indicators that you will see the first time you teach an online class is you will see students that are not completing an assignment. So a discussion board assignment is due and you have five students that didn't complete. And, uh, and in an online class, if you start seeing the non-completion, then that's usually a sign of concern. Or if um, they're completing a discussion board assignment and you have one or two students that are just completing it at a different level than everyone else. Usually that's a sign of concern. Um, categorizing the students, are there certain characteristics or 
certain types of students that have difficulty, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we teach us a broad and diverse group of students. I, I think this particular spring quarter, you're just going to have a lot of students that are brand new to Canvas or new to online learning. And so those students are going to have a particularly difficult time. Um, and also just students who are trying to complete their work from home and, and their home environment could be, uh, you know, they could have five siblings and everyone's trying to use the same computer um, or maybe they're sharing a computer with their parent who's working from home. Uh, maybe they're trying to work and go to school at the same time. Uh, or maybe they're just traumatized by everything that's happening and it's hard for them to concentrate. And so I, I think I think we can anticipate we're going to probably have a lot of students that are going to be struggling, but there's things that we can do to help them. Uh, one other thing I'll share with you that's worked really well for me is um, I typically begin every quarter with a getting started in Canvas orientation guide. Uh, the orientation is really just I teach them I want them to learn how to navigate the course site, identify where to go if they need technical support, learn the applications and textbooks needed for the class. They can also get my contact information and then sometimes I will have a, a syllabus quiz or a student info sheet. Uh, this, this includes just really simple information on how to navigate the course. Um, I include some of Canvas tutorial guides that are helpful, but I try to make this specific to this class and I cover uh, information on uh, any information that I usually get from students regarding technology or accessibility. I also have a where to go for technical support. So I include, this is more campus specific, but I let them know where there are uh, self-help guides, uh, where to go on campus if they uh, want to get help directly from campus, on our campus, where they can go by phone, email, and obviously I would change the in-person at the moment. Uh, and then like I said, I have the, uh, in my case, I have textbooks and applications needed for the class, but I try to include all the information there. So I, I first have that. Um, for many of you, you can link directly to Canvas Guides if you don't want to create anything yourself and go to your campus's uh, IT or teaching and learning center or something similar and link to what they have. But the other thing I think I would highly recommend all of you think about doing is because so many of your students are going to be new to online learning. Where do I have it? Oh. Consider in week one creating small low stakes assignments where they can test the different uh, the different things you're going to ask them to do. So, for example, this actually comes from my humanities class. I have a week one uh, test your ability to download and view videos and articles in this class. So this is really simple. I, I do something like this for week one. And so what I do is identify if I'm going to have them download things, if I'm going to have them play videos, if I'm going to have them do a discussion board post, take quizzes, submit an assignment, I'll create these tests for my students that you can make no points or you can make like five points. And the whole purpose of this is for, it's, it's for students, it's to catch the students who have problems. So you can see here, I say starting this week, you're going to be asked to download and read articles in PDF format, as well as download and watch full length films. This is, this is from a humanities class in ABI, MP4, and WKB format. I'd like to make sure we resolve all possible technical issues this week. With that in mind, it's simply like you to download the following and let me know if you have any problems viewing them. So for this one, because I knew that I was gonna be asking them to download lots of things, I asked them to download samples. And then all they had to do for their assignment was if they were able to download and view the files, they just had to submit a note to me saying, it worked great. But if they had a problem, then they had to submit an assignment to me where they let me know what the problems they encountered and then I would see if I could help them. Uh, this worked beautifully for me because what happens is you don't want them to have problems when it's a high stakes exam or a high stakes assignment. So this is an easy way to catch the students all in week one or who are having difficulties. But it was also good for me because sometimes I didn't realize I wasn't clicking off things I needed to click off. Um, Case in point, one of the things I encountered early as an online instructor is I would create an assignment like you see here, but I would completely forget to do this. I would, I would leave it no submission. And so then a bunch of students would write to me going, when is this due? Um, or I can't submit. And so I had to, it was a reminder for me too, to make sure I was doing it correctly. So in this case online, and if I was gonna do file uploads, file uploads, things like that. So 
it worked for both of us, but it's a really, really great way to catch the students who are going to have technical problems. Um, so for all of you, I highly recommend you create something like this week one, um, just to catch those students who might have problems. Hey Tesh, um, we have a couple of people in the chat who are asking if there is any way you could make your material, some of these materials available in Canvas Commons. I'm happy to. Yay, okay, good. So uh, that is excellent, excellent. Um, and just for those of you who are not familiar with Canvas Commons, uh, Tish, could you just quickly model for folks how to access, you know, like the little guy over here that says Commons, could you show folks how to use that? Sure, so you can click on Commons, which you see in the blue bar here. And when you click on it, you can gain access to other people's Canvas course sites that they've created. And you can search by title, name, institution, or tag. Uh, I actually do have a Canvas. Uh, I have one thing. Oh, maybe some for Letitia Lopez. <clears throat> for uh, people on our campus, I just shared my Getting Started on Canvas module. Uh, and so you can see that here. And then if it's something that you like, you can uh, import it into your class directly. You can download it onto your uh, desktop. Uh, you can obviously copy it as a resource link, but it's um, it's something anyone can freely access. Tish, thank you so screen. much. That's perfect. I always just think, you know, sometimes people don't know about Canvas Commons. And to be honest, I didn't know that there was, a, anyway, it's just things I've learned from the lifeboats. <laughs> no, and it's really helpful. So I'm teaching uh, intercultural communications for the first time this quarter. And one of the first things I did before I began teaching it is I went to Canvas Commons and I typed in, you can see intercultural communication. And I wanted to see what have other people created that I can shamelessly uh, review, plagiarize, gain inspiration from. And so I immediately went and I started clicking and looking at sites. And uh, I definitely stole a couple things I liked. And I, if I could just highlight shamelessly, they shamelessly. are there to be shared. <laughs> <laughs> they are there to, for you to use without shame. Exactly. Um, George Hugh also has a comment. This is from a little bit earlier, and he just wrote, I completely agree with having students help each other to reduce your email load. I switched to using uh, Slack last quarter instead of a help me discussion. And he loved it. Most students get an answer within an hour and many are answered by students. That's awesome. Isn't that fun? I thought that was a good one. Um, there's also some questions around how, how do you use video for synchronous learning? Do you do synchronous learning? And also if I could add to that, if you could also talk about the equity considerations of, synchro of synchronous learning, I would be most grateful. <clears throat> Okay, so I Call do order. <laughs> <laughs> so I do use videos. Um, I have a couple videos I, I posted. I figured I might be asked. I have, um, for example, every single week, I, I had a just okay and better version. I'll click on the just okay. Uh, it's just okay because you can see it's poor lighting. I have a weird facial expression and I'm recording off the cuff. Um, but one of the things I try to do to both personalize the class for students to feel they have a stronger inner connection with me as their instructor, but also just to provide more context, uh, the bigger, larger overall picture of what are we doing and why and how does it connect to the larger learning outcomes, I post weekly announcements. And the weekly announcements just kind of give a broad overview for the week. And sometimes I'll provide extra context by sharing a story or an anecdote um, or just going into more depth or explanation. And so I use videos to do that. Um, I've also used videos to provide an example. So if I want to give an example to my students of how to do something, I might actually create a short video and have them click and watch it. Um, in my classes, I don't tend to do synchronous. Uh, uh, is, that, is, that, is that what you're asking, Jen? Yes, I think um, mm -hmm. a lot of people are um, are, are exploring the option of doing synchronous teaching. And again, I don't want to tell anyone don't do that, but I also want people to be aware of the equity considerations. And I was just wondering if you could um, speak to that or if you feel comfortable speaking. Yeah, to that. No, no, that's not a problem. So here's what I would say. I, I um, in my classes, I, I tend to conference with my students every quarter and we if, even if I'm teaching online, we, I use uh, Doodle and we set up 
uh, usually 15, sometimes even 30 minute phone conferences with each student. And this last quarter, I connected with all of my students. And of course, we spent the first uh, half of our conference just talking about the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but then we spent the second half talking about uh, how they were doing going all online. And this was, again, towards the end of the last quarter. And one of the things that was really clear is uh, many of them were struggling. Uh, and they were struggling for some of the reasons I mentioned before. For the teachers that were requiring synchronous, uh, taking, taking um, being present in class at specific days and times, it was challenging for them because they no longer were going to school. Many of them were now taking care of their younger siblings or they were having to jockey for space in their home around other people. Um, you know, some, some of them lived in uh, 500 square foot or 900 square foot apartments with two or three other people and they could only find a little tiny corner in which to do their work. And so it was difficult for them to be able to stop and coordinate with frankly everyone in their home at, at a particular day and time so that they could uh, complete their classwork. Um, limited technology is a real issue for many of our students. So uh, if we're asking them to be there at a specific day and time, it assumes that they have their own computer that they can access an internet connection when the reality is many times they're sharing a computer with siblings or with their parents um, and their parents have a job where they're potentially have a job where they're getting paid and so they're going to have first preference on using their computer um, or there's internet you know internet lag time at particular times of day because so many people are online nowadays um, and then finally, just students are distracted right now. We're, we're going through an, an unprecedented pandemic and people sometimes need to be in the right mindset to learn and not everyone's gonna be in the right mindset at the exact same time. Uh, so I think many people and myself included would recommend to try to do asynchronous if, if possible. And it is possible. I, I, I talk with a lot of my, uh, particularly my math and STEM faculty colleagues, and they're the ones who are most uh, uh, fervent about the belief of doing it synchronous. And I think there is, and I think part of it is, I get it. I get, I get that the, need, the learning needs are different than, for example, they are in the humanities, but I also think that there are ways around or mitigating um, that would allow you to teach a course asynchronous rather than synchronous if it's gonna work better for your students. Um, my general comment is I think talk to your students. Uh, the best way you're gonna find out if synchronous or asynchronous is gonna work is by uh, surveying your students, finding out what their life situation and their technology situation, internet connection situation is, and you'll quickly be able to see if synchronous is possible, and if it's not, then I would encourage you to think about asynchronous ways you can teach your course. Tish, thank you so much. And I am going to post a couple resources to the chat. One is uh, thanks to Jared Anthony. Um, I saw this one is making the rounds on Facebook um, around about just like the implications of asking students to share their personal home lives via Zoom. And so I've included that as a link. We also have a really great article that also I found out about on Facebook. Some of my best pro D happens on the Facebook. Um, it's up on low stakes asynchronous teaching during this time. So I'll also post that. And Mark Barrington from Green River has a yeah hello mark has a has a sample text survey so i'll also put the link to that mm -hmm. um so tish thank you and thanks for speaking to all of this so well um there's a related question and then i'm going to move us into a different area if that's okay mm -hmm. um so peter asks tish have you found yourself spending a considerable amount of time calming students down this quarter i almost feel like i have become a de facto therapist yes <laughs> um, yes, I, I do feel like many times my conversations with students feels like therapy. And uh, with some of my students, I'm one of their primary, I'm one of the primary places that they feel like they can go to to talk about it, or at least in particular to talk about their struggles with school, because sometimes they, uh, sometimes some of my students have parents who haven't yet completed higher education or maybe they're the first in their family to go to college. And so I'm the person that they feel that they can relate with. Um, I think it's important to try to create spaces for students to be able to express what they're feeling. Um, one of the things I'm planning to do this next quarter is 
in my first week's discussion, I'm planning to ask them a question around how they're coping with uh, our change in life situation at the moment. Uh, I'm still battling around with the question, but I was going to probably ask them, what are they, what's one thing they found the most challenging, but what's one thing maybe they appreciate um, about our uh, stay at home order in our state? It's a good question. It's a great question. And Peter, I feel like there could be related professional development. And Tish, I'm thinking of Sally uh, mm -hmm. Heilstead right now because I know at Lake Washington when they moved into the four connections, you know, because it's all about building relationships with your students, Sally found herself having to do a lot of professional development around what's the difference between being an empathetic, helpful teacher and a therapist. <laughs> and so I feel like, Peter, mental note, and it's being recorded, um, I'll be thinking about follow-up professional development around, you know, like how, to, again, how do you be an empathetic teacher? Because to just pretend like things are normal you is, can't. yeah, it's frankly insensitive, yeah. right? You know, but at the same time, you also want to be available and present, but not so much that you start to have to do work that you're not trained for. So there is a a bright line or a fine line. Um, I also, and just one other thought while we're on the subject of synchronous, uh, asynchronous, um, Alyssa has really great information in the chat about make sure you connect with your e-learning office and or your dean and see what the recommendation is for your campus. So for example, many of our campuses are not allowing synchronous class and time, class time in Zoom. And this is, uh, this is because we lead with racial equity in Washington state. So we know that due to systemic opportunity gaps, many of our historically underserved students of color, our first generation students, our poor and working class students, they don't have access to the thing. Oh, for, oh, Tish just said this better, but anyway, I'll just reinforce that. And <laughs> if you do offer a synchronous session, the best practice is to record and post a recording for mm -hmm. those who can't attend. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so Tish, if it's okay, I'd like to move us into a different question. Sure. Okay, this is a good one. I, I, I'm excited about this one. This is from Kristen Browning. Kristen, great question. Okay. Tish, your detailed assignments are fantastic. They are. I have had trouble with students getting overwhelmed or missing pieces when I give too much detail. How do you find the balance or make, or make sure that students catch the most important details? And Tish, just extra credit if you mention tilt. <laughs> gotcha. So <clears throat> for all of you who are teaching online for the first time, clarity and organization in your online class is extremely, extremely important. Um, I wanna get into assignments and clarity and I will, uh, the com quick confession I'll give beforehand is I, have a problem of being too verbose, which you probably have seen when we click through assignments. That's my problem. I know it. Uh, I'm working on it. It's a lifelong learning on my part. Uh, but there are some things I've learned uh, that I think I can help you with as well. So the first thing I would say is when you, I would encourage all of you to look at your modules right now, if you're using modules, and I want you to look at how is the information organized inside the module and how are you titling everything that's inside there? A lot of times what I saw when I used to work at our teaching and learning center on my campus is people would just list, dump everything, do that week or do in that particular project. They would just put everything in there and maybe organize it by date. And then sometimes the wording of the the wording on the files will be exactly what it is that you uploaded. So if your document was HT 1.2019, like that's the title that students would see. And it was up to the student to have to click on it to figure out what to do. Two things that I've now do that work really, really well um, in my classes, but I would encourage others to consider doing it is, um, and you can choose, you can choose how you want to use modules. People tend to do modules either by week or by like sequence or project. I choose to do it by week. And I have, in my case, week one introduction to the course. The first thing I do at the beginning is I always include a schedule. So my, I have a week one schedule and I weekly planned week one and then I have the date. Um, I have the homework to complete and I choose, one of the things you want to think about doing in an online class is be really consistent with due dates. If you try to create some things due Monday and Tuesday in one week, Wednesday and Friday the next week, it gets really confusing for students. So if possible, 
try to stick to using the same due dates every week if you can in your discipline. In my case, I chose to have everything due on Thursday and Sunday. And so what I include here is my weekly plan. I kind of give a brief overview of the week. I tell them the homework that's gonna be due, in my case, Thursday and Sunday at midnight. And I even connect it to the learning goals. Uh, this template I got from Tom Gibbons, who's no longer in our state, but I love him dearly and I shamelessly stole this and I use it all the time. Uh, so that's what I use for my weekly schedule. But the other thing you'll notice I do is I have subheaders. So in Canvas, you can go here to the plus. Oops, no, no, I don't want that. Uh, you go here to the three buttons. I forget what that's called. No? Right. Hold on, maybe it is this. Sorry, it's been a while. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, you click the plus button. And you click text header. And then in my case, I will just have, I don't know, assignments due. Thursday, F5, whatever. I've now created the text header you see here. And then I organize all the assignments. Uh, you can see I did it here. All the assignments do Sunday at midnight and all the assignments do Thursday at midnight. So think about including subheaders like this. I and mean, you can choose different ways of categorizing, but think about what's going to be the easiest way for students to um, figure out what they need to complete and when. The other thing I do, which is uh, I've learned over time is really effective, is I always include the week here. And the reason I, and I decided to include the weeks in my, my titles is you're going to find when you create your online class, oftentimes you're going to link to things that you created. And if you, if you have everything listed by week, it's just easier for you to find it. Uh, and it's also easier for students to remember, oh, this is all related to, in this case, week one. The other thing you can do to help make it easier for students is think about your titles and I highly encourage you to use action words. So rather than just putting week one student info sheet, have week one fill out the student info sheet. Rather than week one introduce yourself to your peers discussion board post, instead have week one participate in the introduce yourself to your peers. Um, so think about using action words and how you title. So set up, fill out, complete, review, participate. Um, it, helps, it helps guide students and helps them understand what they need to complete. I see, I know there's some comments. I don't know. Um, I, I do want to say it to Jaya, Jaya Rose uh, wrote, love this text header. <laughs> <laughs> Same, me too. There you go. So uh, text, so assignments, I struggle. It's, you know, so the only thing I will say is I am, I fully admit I'm a little bit too verbose. Um, I'm, I try to get better. So I try to use document design principles whenever I can. So for example, my discussion board posts, I want my students to do at least three posts. I want them to do an initial post, which I have them do Thursday at midnight, and I have them do two follow-up posts by Sunday at midnight. Uh, my tip for you, if you've never taught online and never done discussions, is if you have all discussions due at the same day, they're all going to do their discussion posts like an hour before it's due. So if you actually want to kind of create or replicate a more engaging discussion like you would have in your class, consider breaking up the due dates. And so I have it here where I have the first post due one day, and then a few days later they have their follow-up posts. And um, and so I'm trying to use document design principles to make it stronger. I use headers. In this case, I use some different colored text, which I'm not sure if that meets all accessibility guidelines. Um, yeah, Alyssa. Tish. Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are um, there are built-in header options yeah. in the Canvas um, content editor that you can um, use to stylize your text. So I would recommend using those and then if you also want to change the color, you can go back on top of that and do that. But the general rule is never to use color alone to indicate importance yeah. or to draw attention to something. So um, everything, just so if you don't know, um, all the page names or assignment names or discussion names in Canvas, those are all header level one. And then in the rich content editor, and if you want to open the editor on your assignment there and show people where this is while we're talking, that might be helpful. Um, 
Okay, so Tish has her editor open now, and then where it says paragraph, there's a little drop down menu. And I can just highlight that. Yep, highlight, yep. Drop it down, and then that would probably be um, probably going to start with header two because the page name itself is header one, and you always want to keep the H1, H2, H3 in hierarchical order. So you can see it bumped it up in size, but it didn't change any of your other formatting. So um, that's just like working in a Word document. The same types of stylized features are available in Word. So if you know how to do it in Word, you know how to do it here. And if you can figure out how to do it here, it's super easy to figure out how to do it in your documents also. Yeah. And again, you know, like, I think it's a both and, right? Like, you do the headers. And if you want, you can put it in color. Um, it's, but, but yeah, don't do, it. yeah, but don't do just one. Yeah. And it's actually easier just to do it like that when you first build the course, because if you don't do it right when you're doing building the page or the assignment or whatever, then you have all this stuff that you feel like you have to go back and fix. So it's actually more productive and effective when you're building a course just to do those things up front because it prevents you from having to go back and do more work later. That's just my, my two cents on it. And I think too, I'll just quote our colleague, Jess Thompson, who doesn't work at the state board anymore, but has um, also been with Alyssa, a real leader in accessibility. Just don't worry about going back and fixing things you've already done. It, you know, like it can be really overwhelming. Just start today with whatever you're building, just start there. Does that, Alyssa, is that what you would also say? Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, it's good advice um, so you don't get overwhelmed. But for equity, it would be a good practice as soon as you have time to go back and fix those things when you can. Um, one thing that using the stylized um, features in the content editor or in Word, one thing that that does is it visually organizes the content. So it helps sighted users, but it also helps those who may have vision issues and might be using assistive technology and it prevents um, those users from having to read through every single thing on the page when you have headers in place on a page or in an assignment um, the screen reader can skip to those areas so that they don't, so that somebody doesn't have to read every single word to find just that one little sentence or section that they wanted to to review or whatever yeah Thank you. Yeah. So Tush, we have mm -hmm. a couple, we have, I mean, we can obviously go. Yeah, 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 go for it. Um, but what, uh, what do you think? About? What's next? <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, oh, well, no, what do you so think? Like the, the other, they asked about clarity for the assignments and I actually, I would, I'm going to defer to you. What can you say about tilt and why they should, and some of these assignments have not been tilted. So sorry. But, uh, but what can you say about Tilt that can help them understand why that can be particularly effective in an online class? Can you say that one more time? Yes, so uh, no, sorry. <laughs> one of the other questions I think Kristen was asking was about just the clarity of the assignment and how we can help make them more clear and less verbose. Uh, uh, yes. And so Tilt is a great way of doing that, but I was wondering if you could share more on that topic. Oh my gosh, Tesh, I'll pay you your $500 later. Um, so I have actually been helping my mother um, put all of her junior high courses online. She teaches face to face and so helping her put them online. And so TILT stands for transparency in learning and teaching. And, a basic, and basically they just asked what is the number one thing that faculty could do that would increase retentions of students and they, they had a lot of robust information uh, research that had already been done around assignment design. And so basically it's just a way to make your assignments more transparent. And so what they found is that the three things that students really want to know in an assignment is why is this important to me? So purpose, um, what are the recommended steps I should take to complete this assignment and any steps I should not take? And then the final uh, question is, how will I know I'm doing well? What does success look like? How can I be confident that I'm doing this well? And so again, there's lots of different ways to organize assignments. And uh, Tish, I think you've, you've talked about some really great ways to think about just how to make your assignments clear and useful to students. Um, 
I, I think the biggest thing that I would say is actually not about tilt though. And, and Tish and I both are English faculty and we're trained in assignment design as part of our part of our graduate training. And so one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot with, with tilt and any focus on assignments is that you have to teach your students how to read assignments. And again, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you know, that can take a lot of different, um, that can take a lot of different um, formats. But I think if I were teaching online, I would probably record a short video, maybe two to three minutes, where I just walk students through an assignment and I explain to them how to read it. So almost like a little, just a little video with, um, again, nothing high stakes, nothing, nothing fancy, maybe even a selfie with my iPhone kind of video. But just showing people how to read assignments is really important. Tish, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> no, I think you, you've covered it really well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So Tish, what else do you think um, is useful or important to cover as we sort of begin to bring this to a wrap? So, um, let's see. Uh, a couple other things I might recommend is, just looking at my... Okay. <clears throat> I definitely want to know if anyone has any specific questions, but the other thing I'd recommend is be proactive and intervene with struggling students early. So one of the things I often do in my classes is week one, uh, I do two things. One is I have them set up their Canvas profile and communication preferences. It's a small thing, but I just want them to add a profile picture. And uh, I just give them the video tutorials that Canvas creates for them to look and see how to do that and they can edit to display whatever name they want to use in the class. And this just helps personalize them. It gives them, a, uh, I can see who my students are and what they want to be called. Um, but the other thing I do is I have them complete a student info sheet. And every teacher, or a lot of teachers have their own version of this. Um, mine asks some questions such as, uh, what name would they prefer to be go? What, what name would they prefer to go by? Um, I also ask, what's the best phone number to reach you at? I ask, uh, I usually want to find out what other courses are taking this quarter. Uh, sometimes I'll intervene when I see their answers to this, because sometimes they'll have like four classes they're taking and I may actually respond back and say, do you really think you want to, you know, tell me more about these four classes and that's a lot. Uh, let's, let's talk through this together. Um, Sometimes I ask them about their future education and career goals. In my case, I want to find out uh, information about their past English class taking history. Um, this is my subtle way of finding out if they're running start students is I, when I ask it, when did they graduate from high school. I like to get information on their in, uh, information educational background because this helps me see if they're in the first in their family to go to college. Um, and, uh, and I can use that as extra context. and, and I do also ask them questions about what electronic devices will they be using to complete work for this class? Um, and do they have access to those electronic devices or devices any day or time, or is their access more limited? And I also ask them some questions related to Canvas. So first, for the, so for the first week, I have them fill out the student info sheet and I will review them and see um, and respond. If I, they, I also give them a place to ask questions of me, but I'll look through and if I see anything that's noteworthy that I would like to comment on or follow up questions, I will do that with my students. But if I also collect their contact info, it's a great way for me to reach out to them if I see that they haven't participated. So if I have, especially weeks one and two when the quarter first starts, I pay really close attention and I look to see have my students completed an assignment. Um, there's an easy way that you can do this for all of you if you're brand new to Canvas. So you can, um, when an assignment is due, uh, this, you can look at their, a speed grader and you can see who's completed it. But an easier way is actually, if you go in the grade book, I don't know if it'll do it here, you can, uh, I can go message students who, and I can see haven't submitted yet, and I will get a list. It's I'm not gonna show you now because this has no students, but it'll show you everyone who hasn't completed. And I can quickly see who hasn't completed, and Canvas even will allow me to send a note to just to all those students. Um, and so 
when I say intervene early, there's a couple things you can do that I recommend. The first is you can use this feature here and you can craft a message. And I recommend crafting a message that expresses concern or that just checks in. Uh, so it can be simply, something as simple as, you know, hi, I noticed you didn't complete this graphing and chart assignment. Is everything okay? Are you having any difficulties? Uh, please write back and let me know. I, I just wanna make sure that you're successful in this class. Uh, and I can send it off using this feature to everyone who hasn't submitted. And I usually will hear back from most of my students. Um, and they'll tell me what's going on and then I can help uh, intervene if there's any particular issues. So that's my first level of intervention. And I often will do this, uh, especially week one and two, I'm very proactive. I'll send these messages out within an, an hour of an assignment being due because I want them to know that I'm paying attention. Um, and it, it just, it, uh, if they know that you're paying attention, I, I find that they tend to engage in the class even more. But if I see a student hasn't submitted a couple different times, like it's more than once, then I will intervene further. So that's where I might actually give them a phone call or send them an email using the email address that they've provided. Um, or if I don't call phone call, I'll, I'll send a quick text. And you can do that if you don't want to share your personal cell phone number, you can use uh, Google Voice and it creates a, a fake cell phone number that you can use that can forward to your phone. Um, but I will actually check in in that way too. Uh, and that's, um, and, and I have found that that works best sometimes with, and particularly historically disadvantaged students who may not feel comfortable reaching out to their instructors for a variety of reasons. And so sometimes I find that if I take that extra step and reach out to them, it, it makes a huge difference. I can see some, some comments. Yes, so um, Tish, I think uh, there was a question about um, profile images for students, uh, just be resistant to having images of themselves. I'm, I also, I'm also thinking of that article that I mentioned earlier where they talked about students um, who are maybe in domestic violence situations, you know, who or just students who just wish to be protective. Yes. Um, and so Alyssa has a response to the chat about profile pictures should be optional um, or students could post a picture of something they like. How do you handle it when a student says, I don't want to post my picture? I, that's exactly what I do. I, I do encourage them if they're comfortable to share a picture of themselves so that we, so that everyone in class knows who they're talking to. But for a variety of reasons, some people do not or cannot share their picture. Um, some examples are someone who's been stalked or sexually harassed who doesn't feel comfortable sharing their picture. Um, uh, or just uh, people who don't have access to technology and haven't been able to take a picture themselves that they can post. Uh, for those students, I, I do exactly what Alyssa suggests, which is I encourage them to pick an image of something that they like, um, such as their pets, uh, an image of a great tree, it could be anything, uh, but something that's just maybe a little bit more personal than the sad little gray figure. Sad avatar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other thing, uh, when you, so Kristen Browning has a question about when you send the message through the grade book, does it come to their inbox or is it a comment associated with that assignment? Uh, it goes to their inbox and it goes, even though you're sending that to multiple students, each student will receive that message, not as a group email, but as an individual email. And Tish, I think, um, you know, when I sent you the calendar invite, I made it for 90 minutes, but I was thinking it would be an hour. So I'm, I apologize for my miscommunication. Um, and we normally go over anyway. <laughs> but I did want to ask, like, if you have a lot of content left to cover, um, someone has asked if you'd be willing to do a part two. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have a lot more to share? I can, I mean, I, it's as open-ended. I can cover as much or as little as the group would like. So um, one thing I'm wondering, so uh, Marsha, who asked about uh, making the PowerPoint available, um, we will definitely send you the PowerPoint. And I have, I'm keeping track of all the recordings, the chats, the handouts in one page. And so I've included that link on here. But, um, and we're working on getting that on the Student Success Center website. Um, but meanwhile, Tish, if you're willing to keep going for folks who can stay, that would be awesome. Um, Catherine Barker is asking, how do you use submission comments? Could, can you go into a little bit more detail? What do you mean by how do I use submission comments? 
Yeah, Catherine, um, do you, can you clarify that question? Uh, while we're waiting, Tish, I will say that um, people are uh, just saying how useful and how helpful this has been and how your positive attitude is making everything feel much better, <laughs> much more manageable. Um, and Jared Anthony writes, thanks so much, Tish, for your generosity and bravery in sharing this great material with us today. I mean, the biggest advice I can give to all of you is your courses are going to be a work in progress. and start simple uh start simple for your own sanity because class is starting what three days four days uh well at least not that's not true for all areas for different colleges for my college it starts in four days some of you may have already started or you're about to start but but start simple and recognize that you can build up but also your students themselves they're they're dealing with a lot of change themselves and so sometimes even starting simple even the starting simple helps you it also helps them as well right Right. And also just remember everything you assign, you have to assess it. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so when thinking, like, I know when I first started teaching I online, I was like, okay, they have to be doing something every day and on weekends. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Tish, say it again. Say it louder. Okay. <laughs> no. um, there's a couple different ways you could do assessment made easy online. Uh, I don't know how much people want to get into this, but I'll share a couple things I've done. Let's see. Is it here? Yeah, so as an example, uh, let's say I'm gonna grade a whole bunch of assignments really quickly, uh, and I don't have time to give detailed comments to every single student. Like something I sometimes will do, I don't do this a lot, but sometimes I will, I will do a group announcement out to everyone. Well, I'll tell them how they can interpret a particular grade. So. I will tell them I'm going to release this case study assignment and I tell them if you earn points in this range, you're doing a great job. Great. Keep going. Um, and I tell them if they earn somewhere in the middle, here are some things to keep in mind. Uh, and if they earn lower, I tell them they should come see me or chat with me. And then as you can see, I say overall, I hope this feedback helps you better understand the score on this assignment. Um, and I tell them, in this case, I, I allow them to revise some things, but not others. This is not one they can revise. Um, so sometimes I will do a, I will give feedback to the entire class this way. The other thing I will do is, um, if you're trying to give feedback in an online, online class, you can do like I did with the rubrics. If you create that free form rubric, you can create some custom templates of things that you will say often and fit that in. Uh, you can also have rubrics where you just click off. So in my discussions, I have, I'll show you my discussion rubric. Uh, week one is really simple. I'll show you a more complex one. Uh, let's see. So this is my, this is probably, I don't know how great this one is, but this is my discussion board rubric. I have a quality of initial posts, quality of follow-up posts. Because I'm teaching English, I do have a focus on etiquette, grammar, spelling, and punctuation. And then I wanted to kind of give some points to differentiate those that provide a teaching presence to the class versus those that maybe do um, just a more basic response. Uh, so it, this one is one I can just click. Uh, I can click off where they fall. And then if they want a longer description, they can click here and get more information. And then I can just click save and that goes to that student. Um, so that's a really quick way of doing an assessment. Uh, once again, what I will likely do if it's the very first time I'm doing a discussion board post like this and I'm assigning grades, the two things I'll do to help um, reinforce best practices is I will as I shared on that uh, slide, where was it? I try to help, I try to teach students what a good post is. So I will actually in the discussion that first week respond to the, the, the posts that I think are gonna be full point posts and explain to the entire class why I think they're a full point post. And I find that when I do that, uh, the quality of the discussion board posts go up exponentially. Um, in fact, most people who see my students' discussion board posts 
um, are really amazed at the quality, but a lot of it's because of things I do like this in the very beginning that aren't much work on my part, but, but because this comment is not going to just, in this case, Jason, it's going, or Peter, it's going to the entire class. It, it helps kind of guide the entire class in what to do. Um, what else? I do sometimes give more detailed guides, but to be honest, I created something and I don't look at it. I gave them a more detailed discussion board post or like discussion board grading and grading rubric. They never read this, but I spent like four or five hours on it. It's stupid how much time I spent on this, but they never read it, but it's there. Yes, <laughs> so with you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I spent hours on this. <laughs> no one reads it. <laughs> uh. And like, I was really proud of it because I, I spent a lot of time, like I asked, uh, like this section here, like I, I asked them questions, like guiding questions to get them to think about what's a quality follow-up post, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that ever reads this. Well, uh, we're all reading it now. <laughs> we are loving it. <laughs> so um, I did want to just say that um, Catherine did clarify her comment um, and there, there's been some chat discussion about it. So in the assignment, when you comment to a student, do students see it? Sometimes I'm not sure students are getting them. And yeah, right. And I'll just say really quick, Davis, uh, Davis, I think it's our it's our friend Davis from Shoreline, uh, also English faculty, keeping in mind that some students will likely be using phones or tablets. Uh, what's your thinking about annotations, comments directly in the margins of student paper versus the general comments box and box in the right pane of speed grader? My understanding mm -hmm. is that these devices do a poor job of rendering the comments. They do, and I've, I've actually changed how I grade papers in particular because of that. Um, I actually, this is a whole other conversation. Uh, there's one quarter where I tried nine different grading strategies and I, I try the different strategies in terms of, I looked at, my focus was how much time was I, because I'm an English teacher, we could spend hours upon hours grading papers. And so uh, one particular quarter I was really frustrated with how long I was spending grading. And so I looked at best practices and research and identified nine different strategies that people recommended. And I did each one of those strategies in uh, all of my classes and I timed how long it took me to do the grading. But then I also asked my students to give me feedback on which ones they liked the best. And then I, I tried to find the sweet spot. What was the grading that took the least amount of time for me, but also gave the strongest student feedback? And uh, the winner was audio comments. And so one of the things I do for papers now is I've moved away from commenting directly on papers, um, in part because I feel that that turns me into an editor. And what I instead do is I create a short audio clip that I upload to my students. And the audio clip focuses on conveying to them um, an overview of like, I will say like, hi, this is Tish giving you feedback on X paper. And then I will talk in broad terms initially of, here's what I really liked about your paper. And then I give them some specific pointed feedback that I kind of prioritize based on what are the outcomes for that particular assignment. Students respond really well to that because they hear my tone. And when they hear my tone, they can see I'm being supportive and it feels a lot more personable. And I can also give more context to any sort of critical feedback I'm giving. Uh, Cause if I'm typing it, if they're the, 50th student, student I'm writing comments for, it's going to be really short and sweet, but audio, it just, it's, it's just, it's easier. It's also better for you when you're, instead of typing all the time, your, your back starts aching. Um, audio is just kinder in some ways on your body. And so I often, for papers, I often actually resort to doing audio comments. So I'll fill out a really quick, simple rubric online, but then I upload the audio comment. Um, and that's only for major papers. So Tish, I just want to say really quickly, how have we known each other this long and how do I not know that you did this? And oh my God, it was a whole is, thing. <laughs> why is there not a slide deck about this? Why is there, oh, oh my gosh. One. I have I'm, one. I actually, I show how long it took me to do every single one of them. It's <sighs> great. All right, that's going to be part of part two. Um, I think uh, two people are asking, how do you do audio comments? And also oh, Davis wrote audio. that nine strategies test is blowing <laughs> my mind. Davis, me too, mind blown. So can you show us how to use audio comments, please? <laughs> so there's a couple different ways. I will share what Canvas allows, but then I'll share what I do. So if I'm gonna go to, let me just go to a typical assignment. 
I think I can go to anything. Um, okay. So if you see here on the screen, there's a paperclip icon that allows you to attach files. There's a media comment, and then there's a speech recognition. There's two ways you can leave audio feedback. If you click the media comment, a screen, a thing will pop up and it asks if it, Canvas can access your microphone and your camera and you can click allow. And you can choose if you wanna do webcam. I never do webcam, they don't need to see me. Uh, so I just click mic. Um, and then you can literally just start recording. And so you start recording, it gives you a three second warning. I give my feedback. If it, my feedback really sucks, I click start over. But when it's all ready, I just click finish. And I, you can title it and then you can save it. And you'll notice that it saves immediately and directly into Canvas. Super, super simple. The only challenge for this is really, frankly, for the English folks uh, here, most likely, is because when you do the audio comment on Canvas, I can't scroll the I can't scroll up and down through the paper. Um, so if I need to scroll through the paper as I'm giving my feedback, well, what I will instead do is I'll use a free program called Audacity, and I'll record an MP3 file, and then I will upload it using this file attachment. Or I can go here to the media comment, and you notice it has an upload media, and then I can upload in this case the audio file. <clears throat> what I do the very first time when I do this is I include a note, which again, I created a template for, and the note is a note I give to all students just saying, I'm giving you feedback uh, via audio. Uh, if you have troubles downloading or listening to this, let me know, or if you would prefer to get written feedback instead, let me know that as well, and I will instead come back and give you written feedback. Um, so it's a standard thing, I just, I just copy and paste and put on everyone's uh, assignment the very first time. And then I would say, and I've been doing audio comments now for about four, four years, I think. Um, I've only really had two students that said they would prefer written comments instead. So most of them, uh, the grand majority say they prefer audio. This is fantastic. And Alyssa has added, you can also record video comments. You can. And Davis wants to know, what about just downloading the assignments and having them open in Word? Uh, you can, yeah, no, so when I do, particularly, oh, yeah, so if you, well, you still would have to adjust your screen a bit to have it open and, like, adjust your screen so that you have Word and Canvas open at the same time, or just to toggle well, and yes, you can definitely do that. Okay. Um, a quick note, I, the number one, so when I, when I surveyed students and asked them which are the grading types they liked, their number one was video, uh, video feedback, so they liked it when they got the audio, but then they saw me scrolling through the paper. The reason why that didn't work is that, uh, remember I was saying I was looking at it both the time spent for me and the feedback from students, and the time for me was exponentially more with the video feedback because it took longer to render. Um, at least with my computer that I had at the time, it was, it was taking I forget how much longer, but it would take anywhere from three to five minutes more just to render the, the feedback and upload it. And so that was just causing my grading time to increase exponentially. And I found that the students, when they talked about, do they prefer video or audio? Like it was, it was minute in terms of, like they, they liked both, but the video wasn't so high that, that um, the extra time on my part made sense. So Tish, um, people are writing in, this is fantastic information. Um, Jaya, I love your comp. Wow. <laughs> that's, I know that's how I feel like, wow, this is amazing. I, I'm learning so much. Um, Mary Fox writes, I agree. This has been an hour incredibly well spent. Thank Good. you, Tish. Uh, wonderful presentation from Rhonda. So I think maybe what I would ask is if we could wrap this up knowing, oh, um, just one more, a behavioral science professor, this is from Mercy, a behavioral science professor once shared that when you have been completely in the dark 
and then light a single match, you square the darkness, you become geometrically more aware of how much you do not know. I have loved this presentation, okay. but oh, period, my period. I have so much to learn. Thank you so much, Tish. And yes, please for part two. Definitely. So what I'm wondering is, Tesh, maybe um, maybe part two could be in a you know in a few weeks, like a week or two weeks after folks have had a, a chance to maybe try some of these strategies out, and then I think people will have a lot more questions about like ah that that's that's the kind of question. What I would actually love, so if people are <laughs> yeah. genuinely interested in a part two, I would love if. Uh, this group submitted your questions and comments. So what did you struggle with? What did you find challenging? What questions have kind of been raised in your head the first couple of weeks? And then we can collect them all and then we can focus, we can do a session where we really try to tackle the bulk of those. We can totally do that. That's a great idea. Um, and so if you would like to be contacted about a part two, um, if you haven't already typed your email in, please type your email in. And Tish, I don't know if you can see in the chat, but people are just weighing in. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much. Um, yeah, just uh, Davis, I agree with the other comments, super helpful. I'd love to see the full PowerPoint, even if the second section goes in another direction. Um, yeah, people are just really loving this. So Tish, thank you so much. Uh, the other thing I'll try to do is I'll try to create a Canvas Commons site with the uh, with some of the assignments I specifically referenced. But if I missed any and you would like to have something that you just happen to see on the screen, uh, for example, I've done a lot of group work assignments online, which I know some of you are wanting to dive into. I can share uh, what's worked really well for me there. Um, but I'm happy to upload that into a Canvas Commons site so everyone can access and download it. Tesh, thank you so much. Um, and again, too, I just want to say, um, I don't want to say um, I want to say thank you for your generosity and your willingness to share your tremendous hard-won expertise as a scholar of online learning. Um, again, like I had no idea that you basically did a scholarship of teaching learning <laughs> research project on the the sweet spot um, for responding. It's pretty it awesome. It was done in the desperation as an English teacher. I'm sure the other English faculty here understand. Oh God, yes. I, I think before I stop recording, I'm gonna read one more comment from Olga. Thank you for your joy. I am going to make sure that I'm in a happy space when I record my videos to spread the positive attitude. I appreciate your time. You are most welcome, Olga, thank you. Olga, I, um, and, and Carolyn Robertson wrote, so true, Robertson wrote, so true. And Olga and Carolyn, I just want you to know, like. I oftentimes turn to Tish because sometimes I go to a dark place and Tish always makes me feel better. Um, Tish, you're an amazing person. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody. Um, uh, Tish, anything else for the good of the order? <clears throat> no, I think I would just simply say, uh, just be kind to yourself. Uh, do maintain a positive attitude and uh, yeah, and just know that you and the students are in this together and that if you kind of take that attitude, I, I think everyone is going to be forgiving and understanding and supportive of each other. Um, so uh, just, yeah, go into classes with the attitude and I have a feeling this quarter will be uh, survivable. And if not, and even beyond that, it could be really, truly excellent. But one thing I'll, I'll say as someone who's taught online that, that for, especially for those of you that are new to online teaching is I have really grown to love online teaching because of the connections I make with my students. Uh, in a typical class, you will have students that are typically silent in class discussion. They may never speak or rarely raise their hand or talk with you, but in an online class, people can't do that. They, they have to respond on the discussion board or they have to write to you. And so there's a really wonderful opportunity to build really meaningful connections with your students um, that I hope many of you will embrace and uh, experience. Yeah, well said. Fantastic as always, Tish. You never disappoint. <laughs> Thank you so much. You were great. You. Yeah, very practical tip shared too. That was awesome. It was, it was awesome. Alyssa, anything else you want to add at the end? No, I just added it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> our praise, our love, our common love for Tish. Well, and thanks. Thank you too, Jen. Oh, yeah. thank you, Jen. It's my pleasure. It's my honor. Um, I, I've been... Oh, yeah, uh, I, like these 
when, when COVID-19 first hit, you know, and I've said this on other lifeboat strategy sessions, I just, I had no idea how do you do professional development in a pandemic? And the, the level of conversation, the questions people ask, the compassion, the generosity, the humility um, that people, the, the willingness to kind of be beginners again is really, and also to resource is just so inspiring. But what I'll just say is that I think many people when confronted with that would have just hid under their comforter and, you know, waited until the COVID-19 crisis passed. Uh, but you didn't. Aww. You actually stepped up and said, what can we do at the state level to support all faculty? And I, I know I'm not alone in saying how much I appreciate that you helped bring these lifeboat strategy sessions to all of us and did it so quickly. Um, I, I know it's been a huge help to so many faculty across the state. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you. And I, I do want to say um, just also really quickly that Alyssa is the one who kind of modeled it for me because like I was sort of like, I was not literally, but metaphorically huddling under my comforter. And then Alyssa was like, I'm offering, what did you call it, Alyssa? Yes, you canvas. Yes. <laughs> I love yes, that. you canvas and learn to zoom. <laughs> Tish, isn't that great? Point. I was like, oh, this could be fun. We could have puns. There could be so many puns. Right? Yeah. You had me at puns, Alyssa. Thanks. I like to make my titles interesting. So They're great. Pay attention. Yeah. They're great. I will say, uh, Tish, I was watching the final episode of Ozarks, and I, I won't give away any plot spoilers, but there is a moment when when Wendy, the heroine, crawls under her comforter and just won't come out, and I was like, oh, I have empathy for you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that right now. <laughs> oh, all right, everyone. Thank you so much, and I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks again, Tish. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Tish.